You're listening to Southeastern Flies, the Angler's Influence. Fishing was probably, I don't even remember the first time I went fishing, but it was in my grandparents' pond Uh in the Ozarks in Arkansas. And we would do that. We would go up there for a week every summer and a week around Christmas every year. Uh, Drive up from Texas with my parents. How long of a drive was that? It was about six hours, six Six and a half hours, something like that. Yeah, we'd we'd just hop in a little John boat and me, my dad, my uncle, maybe one of my cousins, and just fish for brim and bass. And that's, yeah, so that's as long as I can remember. Wow. Uh, I remember catching my first fish. I think I was about four. I caught a brim with nothing on the hook. I just, I was just a little kid, you know, dangling my hook around and caught a little brim. And I was like, you know, obsessed after that. Just the coolest thing. And there were really big bass in that pond. It was a classic kind of farm pond scenario, you know, with a lot of cows around. So a lot of fertilizer around. Right. <laughs> and, right. Uh, and uh, big lily pads. And you would hook these big fish and they'd come up and jump and then you'd never see them again. Yeah, tail walk and then dive into the lily pads. Yep. Yeah. So that was always that that mystery kind of brought you back of like you know they're in there, and you know that the scenario exists that you could get them out of there. Out yeah. Of those lily pads, but I never really did. I mean, I, I caught you know maybe some four or five pounders, but every now and then my uncle and my cousin would you know this was before you could just text a photo, but they would they would go get some photos printed up at Walmart and then mail us uh-huh. you know some photos of a of a ten pound bass or a twelve pound bass out of that little pond it was makes you want to come back yes really bad yes yeah welcome in this is southeastern fly we're talking to uh david cannon of david cannon photography we're sitting in helen georgia today uh as you know we make our we do all of these live usually from somewhere pretty cool and uh we're at unicoi outfitters we're sitting upstairs and it's the first nice day that i can remember yeah maybe since uh it's really only rained twice this year from November to the end of December, and then from about January 1st or 2nd all the way through to about last Thursday. <laughs> uh, the last last episode that we did was with uh, Charity Rudder, and it absolutely was pouring down all the way from Nashville to uh, Townsend. Yeah. And it poured down all the way back until all of a sudden, about 10 o'clock at night, the, the sky turned clear and the stars came out and then the next morning i woke up and it was pouring out again so it's been like monsoon season this year it has been so we're talking to david cannon of david cannon photography and you're a photographer based near atlanta is that right Mm -hmm. okay and you you specialize your in two totally unrelated types of photography yeah which is which is pretty cool so there's the architectural side of David, uh-huh. and then there's the lifestyle or outdoor side. We're going to call that the outdoor side. Of okay, the that's fly. fine. We're going to specifically hone in on fly fishing because that's what Southeastern Fly is all about. Right. So, welcome to Influence. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, so let's talk about uh, let's talk about the architectural side okay. of David's David's work. What uh, What do you do there? Uh, I mainly just shoot either you know homes or retail spaces or commercial spaces for. It might be an architect, it might be uh, an interior designer, a custom builder, a countertop company, or all of the above. A lot of, a lot of my shoots now, I'm shooting for everybody that was involved in the process, and everybody kind of has stake in the shoot and gets images. So uh, it's fun, though. I, I worked construction for a, a few years, like high school and college, uh-huh. and so I've always, I don't know, I just, I, I, for some reason, I love shooting that stuff. Yeah, good for you. So where where can you where's a good place for for me to go see your work? Uh just my website I guess would be the easiest place, davidcannonphotography.com. Okay. And I heard rumor has it that you have have a shot for Southern Living and some of those other types of of uh life of uh of architectural maybe magazines and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, I, I I probably should try to play it cool, but a lot of times when stuff like that happens, I'm just I I get excited. It's okay to geek out about <laughs> it. Yeah, it's okay. I probably should act like I've been there before, but it's when it happens, I'm always I I, I do geek out. That's sure. that, you know, there's nothing wrong with with being excited about what you do. Yeah, there really isn't. That's you know, it, it's always good to to like what you do and let people know that you do it. I know a lot of folks that hate their job. Yes, and. Nobody really wants to be a rent, be one of those guys. No, not at all. And the the cool thing about that is I had my book. I've got a book on fly fishing in the state of Georgia. Uh huh. And I've got a I don't even update it, but I've got a little Facebook page for the book. And this builder in Atlanta 
followed, he bought my book and then he followed my Facebook page and we became just friends on Facebook. And so, uh, I started seeing his work in my Facebook feed and his, the stuff he builds oh, is yeah. beautiful, top of the line stuff. He's a Southern living home builder. And so I started just like once a month sending him a little message. Hey, you know, can I, can I shoot your stuff sometimes? <laughs> right. But he already had somebody. So I kind of laid off and about a year and a half later, he wrote me back and he said, Hey, our, our photographer moved. Can we hire you for a shoot? And so we did like over, I think the course of seven shoots, we got five of them in Southern Living. Wow. Which was awesome for him and awesome for me too. Oh, you know, we yeah. were both just ecstatic. So uh, his name's Randy uh, Schiltz and T. Olive Properties in Atlanta. They just, they build beautiful stuff. And he's ac- he's actually, uh, when when the construction industry goes south, as it does time to time, he, he guides a little bit. Oh, okay. Uh, he's a great you know, angler, sportsman, bird hunter. Okay. Really cool guy. So how do you go from architecture into uh, outdoors or or the outdoor lifestyle? How do you get there? So that really photography for me started with the outdoor stuff. When I got my my book deal for this Fly Fishing Georgia book 10 years ago, it's a big, it's a bigger book. And it's most state kind of guidebooks are like glossy cover and then cheaper paper, black and white on the inside. Yeah, right. And this publisher does all slick, glossy photos everywhere, all throughout the book. And I didn't shoot photos. And so they let me hire a buddy of mine who's a great photographer to shoot the photos. And the deal was that he would teach me photography while we did the book as well, because I wanted to learn. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. I, I was writing a lot at the time, and it's it's easier to sell you know, a story package to an editor if you have the images with them. Right. So, so anybody out there wanting to write a book, you need to perk up and listen. Cause, yeah. Because yeah, you're you, telling us how to do it, basically, or yes. some of the ins and outs of it anyway. Yeah, and, and you don't need to be great, but if you're proficient, if you can if you can write well, and then you're a proficient photographer, you'll get a lot more work than somebody who's just a really good writer because both are needed. Yeah, you, you can know, make editors a package need out both. Of and editors have to go run after and track down photos if they don't have them readily available, which is right. a lot of work on their part. So uh, so my photography life started with the outdoor stuff. Okay. So where does your photographer's photography, where is it? Where, do, where can we see it besides your website for the outdoors? Um, the, the places that I get most excited about are uh, Gray Sporting Journal. Mm-hmm. That's, that's the one that it took me forever to get published there years of rejection from them. I think eight years of getting rejected every couple of months before they finally published me. I've got a photo essay coming out in their May, June issue. Uh, that's a really cool one. It's on catching a wild tiger trout here in the South. Oh, okay. Really, really crazy scenario. But, uh, and then like the fly fish journal, beautiful, beautiful magazine. Oh yeah. I work a lot with Eastern fly fishing magazine, uh, most every issue. And then here and there, like the Drake, uh, Fly Tire, American Angler, you know, so those those great industry publications that we've got. So we can we can find you just about anywhere. Grace Hopefully, is pretty yeah. cool. Grace is a different different type of uh, magazine for yes. me. It's one of those that you actually sit down and kind of set some time aside and say, all right, I'm going to maybe get some bourbon. Yep. And I'm going to sit and sip this bourbon while I read Grace, while I read this maybe one story. Yeah. You know. Well, and, there's, and that's that's what people don't realize who don't read that publication is it is literature yeah and uh, i i worked there for a couple of years i was on staff it's the same group that owns american angler and fly tire and uh, they've got the angling report they're based out of augusta right uh, georgia and uh i remember when i was working there this was 10 or 12 years ago uh general norman Schwarzkopf. you remember him i do yes yeah. he, he submitted a story and it wasn't quite good enough really seriously i mean and that's and they, they don't show preference to, you know, big names. Right. But uh, it, it was a good story. But if you get a, a especially some literature published in there, you, you're a really accomplished writer. That's the real I, deal. I don't ever plan on getting writing, my writing published <laughs> there. So. You never know. Never say never, never say always. And you're shooting for some brands as well. Is that right? Yeah. Um, probably a a year and a half or so ago now, I, I joined uh, Winston Fly Rods Pro Photography Team, and that's just a great group of photographers. Um, most of us aren't super well-known guys. Like, you know, there's Val Atkinson isn't on the team or Brian O'Keefe or Brian Grossenbacher, none of those staple fly fishing photography names. But I think a lot of these folks that are on this group in 10, 15, 20 years, they're going to be those, those people. Guys, yeah. yeah, there's just a lot of, lot of really super – 
talented people on that group, except for me. I'm, but I'm on <laughs> it, so I don't care. Um, my my big ones now that I, I'm just loving working with them is for uh, it's it's one group now, but Cabela's and Bass Pro, um, and so they have a lot of different ways that they do their photography. But uh, I've got I think about thirty or thirty one days with them in 2019, doing okay. everything from like some Montana fly fishing for them to I've got a elk hunt in Utah. I'm shooting for them and uh I think an Alaska trip. So a bunch of cool stuff. Bunch of bunch of stuff that's like again, I probably should try to play it cool, but it's like pinch me sort of yep. stuff. I'm actually getting to do this for work. So we've talked about uh your family kind of taking you in on that farm pond and you said it was in Arkansas, what part of Arkansas? Yeah, northwest Arkansas, the Ozark Mountains. Okay. And about how far from so as as us fly anglers tend to think of Arkansas, our minds go to the white. About how far from the white are you? You're probably about an hour or so west of the white. Okay. Yeah. All right. So more toward the state line then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're getting close to, you know, Missouri. Like, I remember when we'd go there, my parents and aunt and uncles, aunts and uncles would always go up to uh, Branson, Uh, you know, to go see a show or something like that. I don't know. There's some fly fishing up that way too. Yes, I've heard. I haven't been up there. I need to go do that. I, I find it hard for a long, long time. I never made it past the white. Yeah. People would ask me, have you been to Montana, Colorado? And I'm like, yeah, I don't know. I made it to the white. I mean, I can't get there's, past there. But And there's and if you look at the rest of Arkansas, I mean, there's blue ribbon smallmouth fishing all through. Oh, yeah. Right. So there's there's a lot to do there. Yeah. It's a great, it's an underrated state. It really is. It really is. And, and you hear about the white a lot of times, yeah. and, and which is cool. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, as I love that river. Definitely. Um, but there's a lot, just like there is here in North Georgia, there's a lot of opportunity if you just can get with somebody yeah. and, and figure out where it is and what it is and, and how to fish it. So as your family went on with you, um, let's let's take a walk through David Cannon's fly fishing journey here and, and uh, tell us what's going, what happened uh, after you learned how to fish with your family. So I think I, I always found places to fish like around like where I grew up like a little creek or a pond nearby or something. And then I I went to college up here in the mountains. I went to a little school for two years called Young Harris College. Yeah. And then I finished up at North Georgia. It's called University of North Georgia now. It was a different name then. but And I started fishing a couple of creeks not too far from school. Uh-huh. And skipping class. And, <laughs> you know, I'd say, well, should I go sit in sociology or should I go catch some trout? I shouldn't ask myself that question because I know the answer. Yeah. And then that's an easy one, but you know, I was fishing at the time I was fishing, you know, redneck style. I was throwing, there was a, (laughs) there was a, at the Walmart in Dahlonega, they had one of those vending machines with bait in it. So you, you know, you'd put your dollar in and pop out a little styrofoam container with like red wigglers or earthworms or whatever. Depends on what they're biting that day. Yeah. Yeah, Right. (laughs) So I'd go, this is so shameful, but whatever I'd, I'd go get some you know, red wigglers and go fish this one Creek. That was a, it's a heavy put and take Creek. Yeah. And I'd go just catch rainbows and just loved it, you know, and was, I'd never fished moving water before. And so it was such a, it's a whole new world. Oh, that is a new world. Yeah. And then eventually I, I bought, they had an Eagle claw little fly rod combo at Walmart. Right. And I was like, I'll just buy that and see if I can figure this thing out. And is that one of the yellow ones? Was it wasn't one, one of the yellow ones. Okay. I've, actually, I've got the yellow one. Do you really? I do, yeah. yeah. But this one was, it was actually a pretty good looking, I don't remember the name of it, but it was a like kind of a brownish maroon finish and had a good good looking silver, a large arbor reel on it. I mean, it was a good looking little setup. It must have been the premium setup. I, yeah. I But it, I think it was pretty cheap though. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it looked, it looked nice. Yeah. I remember just having no clue how to manage the line, you know? Oh, yeah. You do that now and you just, you instinctively put that fly line in your finger and start stripping line and mending and you're not even thinking about right, it. right right after but, a while it kind of becomes natural but at first it's oh, totally man. foreign at first it's just like this is a lot of unnecessary work you know <laughs> but it's and i'm it, catching less fish yeah almost every time now i'm catching nothing yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that's that's how i think it was my senior year of college when i finally picked up the fly rod and there's a ton of opportunity here in north georgia i lived yeah. in north georgia for four or five years. Where'd you live? Which part? Just below Chattanooga in a place called Ringgold. Yeah. And there's, there's some opportunity over that way, but as you get more and more down here toward Helen and up into the mountains, there's a lot of opportunity up here. Some pay streams and some other types of water. I'm sure there's probably some smallmouth somewhere, maybe a little further south of here. We don't have much smallmouth in Georgia. 
we have we have some like up in uh, like a little bit in Rabin County, right? Uh, and then really the only other place you're going to catch smallmouth in the state of Georgia, unless I'm just completely off or don't know something, which is possible, <laughs> uh, is somebody about seven or eight years ago illegally dumped a bunch of smallmouth in the Savannah River near Augusta, and they've been doing well. Really? Yeah. And, and is there are there shoal bass around here? Yes, okay. right here in the Chattahoochee. Oh, really? Yeah, like so, the the actual shoal bass. So we're sitting we're sitting at Unicoi, mm-hmm. and there's a the Chattahoochee is right. I could probably throw a rock yeah. into it, and so right there is trout water. Is that right? Right there is trout water. There's a little spillway dam, a couple hundred yards down. Uh huh. At a little grist mill. Right. And yeah. that that's going to block the shoal bass. But downstream of that mill, especially when it warms up, you'll catch shoal bass right there. Okay. But yeah, all all down this upper river, yeah, you can catch some nice shoal bass. No kidding. Yeah. Okay. So small smallmouth in Rayburn County, shoal bass, some smallmouth, uh, a little more south of here, I guess. Yeah. But uh, we are in the middle of trout country for North Georgia. Four thousand miles of trout streams. It's a lot of water to cover. It is. Yeah. People. I mean, you would never think that as yeah. far south as we are, but mountains help out well jimmy's sitting in a perfect place too yeah and again he's got the the rocking chairs out front which i took full advantage of whenever i first <laughs> rolled in here if you uh, can sit in a rocking chair and hear hear some water running that's, that's, all, that's a good spot that's a good day right there yeah I can, that's that's better than sitting out in front of cracker barrel <laughs> <laughs> so as you started through you started fishing you bought you a, bought a, a fly rod from walmart yeah which is cool because you you know you got it in your hand that way it was probably relatively inexpensive, yep. although for a college kid, nothing's relatively inexpensive. Exactly. But uh, that really started you down on your uh, down the road for your fly fishing career or pastime, I guess we should say. Yeah. So as you as you've got this eagle claw and you're fishing, let's let's start walking down that road. Okay. So, I I I'd, I'd had a little bit of success. Actually, I remember one day I down here on the Chattahoochee, about a probably about two miles, maybe a mile and a half downriver from where we're sitting right here. I was fishing a little lightning bug nymph, and I was drifting. I had no clue what I was doing. I didn't know how to dead drift. I didn't even know what dead drifting was. Right. But for some reason, this brown trout grabbed onto it, and it it was about an eighteen inch brown trout. A big and dumb brown trout. So dumb. It's that's I, great. And I love brown, dumb brown trout. And I don't know that I've come across another dumb one since then. But those are my favorite fish. Yes, me too. <laughs> it's a, but that thing, I got that thing to hand, and I just remember just staring at that, thinking, "Wow, what an amazing fish!" But then after that, I mean, I I didn't hardly catch anything for a few months, and I was fishing. I, my one of my cousins from Texas was here, and I took him to Duke's Creek, which is not far from where we're sitting. And it's a state managed trophy stream. You can get re- it's free, but you have to get reservations. It's like fifteen anglers per day, Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays. They take reservations. So do they give the fish a rest during? The- yep. Do they really? Yeah. Okay, that's good. And it's a good place. It's uh, you know if you're there when it's on, it can seem almost easy. Right. But most of the time, my experience has been ninety percent of the time, it's a very tough place to fish. Okay. Uh, because it's catch and release, and because skilled anglers are fishing for them multiple times a week uh and it's really tight water and right. really tight casting lanes so it's it's a it's a challenge and we just spooked every fish we saw that day <laughs> and we got to the parking lot and everybody else had done well and i was like man i'm gonna get i'm done with this this is stupid i'm wasting my time i'm gonna go back to the you know walmart uh vending machine right and, and, and start catching fish again and this guy walked up to us and said how'd y'all you know how'd, how'd you do well not good and he knew everybody else had done well and so he said do y'all want to you know we got two hours of daylight do you want to come to smith creek with me and i can teach you a few techniques and i thought well if this guy's not some sort of mass murderer this could be a good deal so totally out of the blue just out of the blue you didn't know this guy i didn't know this guy uh his name's jeff derniak he's uh over fisheries for wildlife resources for the state of georgia uh in all of north georgia okay and this guy does more, I think, for fishing up here than probably any one person. He just, he's, I, I found out shortly after that 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 was not uncommon. He does that all the time. He's constantly finding young folks and just giving them enough information to say, okay, now go have fun. 
Good for him. Yeah, he's he's a great guy. Um, Wait a minute, did I just meet him? You just met him. On That's the, right. On the front he was porch. on the front porch. What? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So uh, so he taught us. He taught my my cousin and I drag free drift. Taught us just a few simple techniques: water loading to you know cast back upstream, drag free drift back down, water right. load cast upstream, and uh, and we caught a few fish. And you know, light bulbs started going off. It's okay. This thing's making sense a little bit more. Had a little repetition in there too, right? Yeah, and you yeah. get that reward of a, of, yeah. you know, okay, I'm doing something right, and they're a fish ate. Right. So that, that cements something in your head, and it was enough at that time to say, okay, maybe I'll keep doing this a little bit longer, see if yeah. I can figure it out a little more. And water loading really helps your casting yeah. too. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to be a, a, a super great caster. If you can load it in the water, there's enough tension on the on the rod and bend in the rod to get the fly to take off and right you're like wow that was pretty good yeah makes it a lot easier <laughs> especially if you got branches yeah you know which we do here in right. North georgia we're not we're not a high desert out west stream or something right There's, it's a little it's a different technique yeah yeah so uh yeah uh, running into him really changed I, I didn't know it at the time but it changed everything for me we were talking earlier about he he's got this email list that he's had for i don't know how long he's probably had it for 20 years now and he put me on that email list and you just get the fishing updates from what's going on in North Georgia, the lakes, the rivers. And I replied one day and I accidentally replied all <laughs> and asking some question about some river or something that was in this email. And one of the guys that replied to me was a guy named Brad Bailey. And he was editor of Georgia outdoor news magazine. His, one of his sons and I played basketball together as kids and through high school and everything. And he, I used to go on trips with them. I'd go on, you know, to Lake Seminole with them on spring break so that Mr. Bailey could write an article. Oh, okay. And uh, he replied and he said, is this the David Cannon that I know? And I said, yeah, you know, hey, Mr. Bailey, man, I hadn't, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't talked to him since the end of high school. Right. And uh, he said, what are you doing? I said, I just graduated college and I'm, I'm doing an internship right now, but I'm looking for a job. And he said, we've, we've got a job. And so it was an ad sales position with the magazine. And I, got, I ended up getting that job. And uh, a couple months later, started writing for the magazine. They needed some help, and I, I enjoyed writing and had always done okay at that. And so that was just another, you know, it was like I meet this guy in this parking lot. Right. And start to learn fly fishing a little bit and then get a job. Right. You know, Make a mistake and reply to all. <laughs> yeah. Right. Make, so I stink at fishing, which led to help, which <laughs> led to a mistake. And, yeah, it's like just a, me messing up a bunch. And yeah. Then, you know, people being gracious and, and helpful. So, so, and that's what, I mean, let's face it, this, and we talked about this just a little bit before we, we uh, started recording, but this sport, this pastime is littered with people that will help you. Yeah. Good folks. Yeah. A lot of good Absolutely. folks. Absolutely. Every now and then you run into a jerk, but yeah. it's such a small little bubble that I think the jerks don't last too long. No, and I mean we got to have somebody to make fun of too. True, that's right. True. If, yeah, if you got one for them. Around, I guess. Yeah, we need we need at least one every once in a while to remind us how good we really have it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so now you're you're writing. You're starting to write. You're probably getting to fish a little more, possibly a little bit. They would let me out. I think about one day a month to go okay. do like an article, and then they gave me a column, and so I, I had like a two page column in every magazine, just talking about. Uh, either trout fishing or fly fishing. Right. Uh, and it's a hook it, hook and bullet magazine, so it's mainly a, you know, deer and bass kind of magazine. Right. Um, but that was that was really cool getting to do that and uh, ended up going, I guess from there I went to, started working in Augusta at, uh, it's called the Morris Sporting Group, and they actually produce American Angler, Fly Tire. At the time they were also doing Saltwater Fly Fishing Magazine, which is no longer around. I remember that one. It was a good magazine. Yeah, it was. It just, it was, I don't know, they, they closed it for some reason. And then uh, Gray Sporting Journal was their, you know, kind of head honcho title. Uh-huh. And uh, through that, went to the trade show in Denver with them, just working for the magazines. And I met my favorite photographer, a uh, guy named Brian Grossenbacher. Right. And he had just had a book published called Fly Fishing Montana. And beautiful book. Um, he and his wife wrote it. And then he shot most of the photos for it. And I met him, and I was just telling him how much I loved his work. And I said, you know, Georgia, the format of that book that this publisher does, I said, Georgia would be a great state for them to do because we have 4,000 miles of trout streams. We have a ton of warm water. And then we also have 100 miles of coastline. Right. So you can go fly fish for redfish or trout or whatever. 
And he said, well, my publisher's here. You want me to introduce you to him? And I said, yeah, sure. But I was thinking, I, I was like 25 or something at the time. <laughs> so I'm not, this is going nowhere, but sure, I'll meet him. And so met the guy. He said, yeah, we, Georgia's on our short list of states we'd like to do. Uh, there's so many people that fly into Atlanta that you can target them to fly fish because there's tons of fly fishing right. within an hour drive of Atlanta. So I said, oh, that's cool. And then a couple weeks later, he called me. And he's based out of Tucson, Arizona. And he said, I'm going to be in Atlanta on business. You want to get some lunch? And I said, okay. And so I went and had lunch with him. And I got home. And my wife said, how'd that go? And I said, I just signed a book deal. <laughs> and she said, what? And I said, I don't, I don't know. I don't even know if it's a good deal or not. I just, you know, just jumped at the chance. So it was crazy. But it was, it was a really fun project. So does that mean you had to fish more? Yes, like every weekend. Dang, that's terrible. I know it was really it was tough. Yeah, how did you how did you manage? <laughs> you know, I had to I had to pray a lot. Yeah, and uh, sure that helped. Yeah, yeah, it was tough. So where where all did you fish for the book? Do you remember some of the streams or rivers? Yeah, bodies we, of water. We did about three dozen or so locations. Uh huh. Um, we did everywhere from all the way in South Georgia, like Lake Seminole, right, which is a legendary bass lake. It was where the first BASS tournament was ever held, right. I think the average depth of that lake is like 10 feet. So for a fly rod, oh. you know, for a fly fisherman, it's a dream. That's perfect. And they've got a lot of good bass in there and some stripers as well and a few other oddball species, uh, bowfin, stuff like that. Really, really fun place to fish. I mean, it's like a, you know, fifteen 15 or 20,000 acre bass pond is what it looks like. There's right. Stumps everywhere, lily pads everywhere, over to places like, you know, the Georgia coast, Cumberland Island, which is a the craziest place I've ever been. Uh, there's wild horses running the beach. Right. There's all these burned down mansions from the Gilded Age, like the Carnegie family and all right. those families. And there's a there's a settlement of folks that still live there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's all it's all being like uh, it was grandfathered in. Like the people who own places there got to stay there, right? But within the next, I don't, I don't remember how many years now it is, but it'll it'll all be reverted to. National Seashore. Or I don't. Right. I can't remember off the top of my head what the protection is, but yeah. So those, that uh, group of folks I heard, that group of folks that lives there, uh-huh. will have a potluck dinner on Wednesday nights or one night during the week. If you get invited to that, you're in. Oh, I, I'm, I haven't heard about this. I have. I got I, a new goal now. Yeah, me too. Okay, me too. Yeah. So yeah, I'd heard a lot about that. So where else did you? Where else did you have to fish? Uh, one of my favorites is the Flint River. Uh huh. And it starts as a little just bubbling spring uh, at the world's busiest airport, Atlanta Hartsfield Jackson International, and uh, it's right next to the Delta maintenance hangar. Right. Just bubbling out of the ground, and then it cuts through Middle Georgia, and at certain spots in Middle Georgia, if you go fish this river, you it looks like you're in the mountains. It cuts through some big bluffs, and shoal bass is the is the key species there right and they love hitting top water it's just a it's an awesome fly fishing scenario beautiful river there's also a lot of history in that river like uh there's i I know a guy who's got a big megalodon tooth oh wow from out of that river. you know ancient giant shark tooth right um and he's got like two five gallon buckets full of shark teeth from out of that river no kidding and then there's either two or three still like intact whale skeletons in that river so it's just a weird place. Yeah, that's one of my favorites. I think that's probably actually tied for my favorite river in Georgia, with the Chattooga, which is Georgia South Carolina border, right? Coming out of North Carolina. Yeah, right. Beautiful river. First, the first uh, river designated by Congress as a wild and scenic river mm-hmm. in the early seventies. Great fishing. There's some wild brown trout, and then there's some other op- like catch and release opportunities, delayed harvest. So. You can go enjoy the river if you're just starting out, you know, hit DH. Or if you really skilled angler and know what you're doing, try to fool some of those old wild brown trout. Right. That's a great one. And then other places like the Chattahoochee Tailwater uh, coming out of Lake Lanier. And then one of my favorites, too, is Lake Lanier itself. Uh, you get sort of a saltwater scenario right. in, the, in the fall and winter. Uh, striper schooling. You'll have Sometimes you'll have acres of striper schooling on the surface and, you know, tossing a little two inch thread fin shad looking fly in there and catching a 15 pound 20 pound striper 
That's with it. all that going on, seagulls diving. I mean, it's just like being out, you know, Outer Banks. Right, It's right. crazy. And, and actually, I, I think I skipped him, Henry Cowan. He's one of those guys that really, Jimmy Harris uh, introduced me to him. And he said, you got to go fish with this guy on Lake Lanier for stripers, fly fishing. And I said, what? Fly fishing for stripers? I'd never heard of that. Right. He said, he said yeah, you, and he's a really fun guy. He's from Brooklyn. You know, he's totally out of place in Gainesville, <laughs> Georgia. And uh, <laughs> That's a and, tough, one to, tough one to get by right there. But yeah, once you yeah. do it, it's probably – you're in, you're in once you're in Man, though. He's so much fun. He's just he's always messing with you. He's got a million different little tricks and gags and pranks and you know, you'll be sitting there if it's slow, he'll come over and little do a little sleight of hand and point and say, "You see some fish busting over there?" And while he's doing that, he'll you look over and he'll he'll tug on your fly line a little bit. Oh, and you nice. won't see it and you think you got something on. Oh, nice. you know, he's always messing nice. with you. <laughs> always talking trash. Lake Lanier is a great one. That's one that that really stands out in my mind. And then you got other places like the Tacoa Tailwater Right uh, near Blue Ridge, mm-hmm. fish there, and then some wild trout streams like uh, Nuntutla Creek. Uh, you got Jones Creek. Both of those are kind of near Blue Ridge. Uh, Jones Creek is only wild brown trout. So those those are the places when I think about doing the book the first time. Those are the places that kind of stood out to me, and just were fun to get to visit a first time. So you've little, literally fished all over the state. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not you know, not everywhere by any stretch of the imagination, but but a good sampling of it. Yeah, for you, sure. you've hit most of the corners anyway yeah so as you're writing this book you finish your book and and who else has come in and and who else have you met that's kind of helped you along and what do they teach you yeah uh jimmy harris was a big one we're sitting in his fly shop right now uh jimmy was one that jeff derniak introduced me to They've, they've been friends for a long time and jimmy's just one of those guys that he's he's super friendly everybody respects him if you don't like him it's probably because there's something wrong with you, right? You know, he's just he's just a good guy, and uh, he's always excited about fishing, and just all uh, he he helps a lot of folks too. All all those guys, Henry, Jimmy, Jeff, they they go out of their way to help younger folks find the fun in what we do, and so, to get good enough at it to to find their own fun to to help that kid in the parking lot that didn't catch anything. Yeah, yeah, that idiot over there. Yeah, somebody <laughs> needs to help him. So. All right, David, let's pay some bills here just a minute. Okay. Southeastern Fly Guided Drift Boat Fishing has been in, been fishing and guiding the waters of Middle Tennessee for over a decade. From trout to smallmouth, largemouth, and muskie, they, we fish on the Elk, the Stones River, the Caney Fork, and we have some private bass water trips as well. Southeastern Fly guides you from the comfort of a 16-foot drift boat for all your favorite species. From the beginning angler to the seasoned veteran, Southeastern Fly, we work hard to make sure every guest becomes a better angler. For questions or information, go to www.southeasternfly.com. All right, so you've got a a great group of guys, folks. uh, And we before we we did this podcast or started recording the audio, you sent a list of people, and it is long. Yeah. It's very long. So for those of you that are listening that are friends of David, I I asked him to pare that list down. It's not him picking out people. It's it's me pushing and prodding him yeah. to to get this into about a forty forty five minute audio. Uh, because if we if we talked about everybody, we would. I'd have to get Jimmy to get that pizza. Yeah, it'd, it'd it'd be a long night. Yeah, it would be. Let's talk some more about just the people and the places that you fish, and then we want to get into some techniques as well, possibly. Okay. Yeah. So you've got you've got Henry and and, and Jimmy and and you're fishing and yeah. I think for through that, those guys helped me to to learn enough to do things like write that column and write some articles for the magazines and get that that book deal eventually. At that point, uh, I I did not shoot photos at all, and so Brian was really, he, you know, when you asked me for that list of three people, he's my he's my last one in okay. that group, and the reason why he's my last one is because his work. Uh, is he has he's just an amazing photographer. If you ever look at anything on Sims website or Sims print promotional materials, he's the only photographer that they've worked with for years. And he is just in, in in my view, he's the best of the best. And he's a really good guy too. His work inspired me. I would just sit and stare and I still do sometimes. I just sit and look at his images and say, why is that so good? Right. You know, what what lens was it shot with? What's he doing with the light that's available? Or is he adding light? What's he focusing on? 
sometimes he focuses on things that I would never think to focus on. How did he, how did he process it? How did he edit the image? What did he do with the colors? There's so many different things that make his work unique. And for that, going through that and asking myself those questions inspired by his work helped me to become a better photographer, which has led to a career for me. And it led to a career for me that really he's my third influence because if I didn't have his work to inspire me and his, his introduction to that publisher for me, um, I don't know that I'd be on the water at this phase of my life. I've got a wife. I've got a six-year-old and a four-year-old daughter. I'm really only out on the water 99% of the time that I'm on the water is because I'm working. Right. And I'm either shooting for a client who's paying me or I'm shooting with hopes of selling those images to a magazine or to a, a brand or something like that. And so he influences my fishing. <laughs> like, I wouldn't get to fish right now if it right. wasn't for him, really. You know what's interesting is I, I went through a phase, bought a camera, and decided I'm going to take really good pictures. I didn't realize that when, I, when I'm on the boat, got somebody on the boat fishing, you know, I'm, I'm tying on flies, I'm netting fish, yeah. I'm saying cast here, cast there, I'm serving water, serving snicker bars. There's not a lot of time to think through that photo. No. You know, but guys like you and Brian inspire me to try to at least, I mean, just for the two or three seconds that I have that yeah. got to have that fish to, to try to turn the boat the right way, at least sometimes. Yeah. And you, and I get that one photo every once in a while, not often that just really turns out good. I'm like, wow, that was really good. Now the next 50 may be, you know, not Throw so ways. hot. Yeah. Right. Right. Or I put them out there just because somebody spent the time to try to catch a fish and I want to make sure that they get their, their photo up there. But, Every once in a while, you get that really good photo, but you guys do it consistently, well, time after time. And I can't speak for any other photographer, but I, there's a lot of days where I'm the same way, and it's a numbers game, uh -huh. and, and it is shooting what's going on a lot of times. I mean, sometimes it's staging stuff, you know, asking anglers to pose a certain way or obviously to hold a fish a certain way. Right. I would say a lot of days I'm that way, and that's why, I, I, you know, I'm the same as you. When, you're, when you say – you're doing all these other things. A couple years ago, whenever Nomadic Waters took me down to shoot for them in the Amazon, I would wanted to fish the Amazon as long as I can remember. And I get there and everybody's making fun of me because they're saying, you didn't even bring a rod? <laughs> I said, no, man, I'm here to work. I can't do both. And I think that puts my clients at ease too because they know I'm just not a guy trying to get free fishing or get paid to fish. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm yeah. there to shoot photos for them. And by the end of the trip, the, Michael, the, the owner of the group, made me fish for a couple hours oh dang but yeah and so i argued with him some but then i finally fished a little bit it was a weak argument yeah 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 it yeah. was weak it was i don't weak. believe you <laughs> and my, my first cast with his rod i caught a 13 pound peacock really that's, now now how were you fishing that so you're in the amazon yeah and that's a great boat by the way to be on if you're going to be down there that's the place to be yeah right and it has oh, air conditioner too right it's a got really a good one that's, yeah that's all you need <laughs> that's all you need uh so what were you fishing whenever you could that was that your first peacock or that was so the the at the early onset of the trip he he had me cast a few times and I caught a couple like two three four pounders mm -hmm. and uh, they were so strong I couldn't believe it I caught them on ten weights and I couldn't believe how strong they were even on a ten weight right but I didn't I didn't really fish much the rest of the week and so the last day he said no I really want you to fish like I'd shot I think eighty one hundred photos wow over the course of four or five days and he said if there's something you haven't gotten. I'm not worried about it. Just here. I'm going to take a water break, take my rod. He handed me his, he had a, the nine weight Winston jungle rod and had a little, probably a four, three or four inch long, um, chartreuse Puglisi streamer. Right. Pretty sparse fly. And, uh, my first cast, I was on the front of the boat casting to the right. So I, I you know, backhand cast and I, I overshot it and I smacked my, that fly down on the mud just, you know, foot off oh. the water. Mm -hmm. And I stripped it into the water, and it barely gotten into the water. And I think I'd stripped it once, once it got in the water, and this giant yellow head rolled over on it. And I just started screaming. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not an enthusiastic guy. I'm very even keel almost all the time. Right. And But I was, I, I mean, my knees went to jello. I don't, I don't have those moments a whole lot anymore where the adrenaline really gets kicking like when you were a kid. Yeah. But a big peacock like that will oh make you, my gosh, man. Make you I lose, just, your, lose your lunch right there and get I, going. I melted. I mean, oh, I yeah. melted. And uh, Michael filmed the whole thing, so he's got all the footage. <laughs> and it was it started running towards this blowdown. And I, I, was, 
I was holding on to the fly line. I was I was applying some pressure to the fly line, but it wasn't on the reel. They were saying, get it on the reel, get it on the reel. And I didn't feel comfortable getting it on the reel because I didn't want to have to, you know, mess anything up. And so I said, man, I don't think I can keep this thing out of this tree. And he said, you've got 50-pound test on there. I thought he had 30 on oh. there. <laughs> and I was like, all right. So I, I put the hammer down and yeah. just started, you know, stripping line in. And the thing started jumping, and we were all – we thought it was a – 17 18 20 pound fish and uh and it was there for just a second it was for a second yeah and if, if i would have lost it it definitely would oh been. yeah it'd probably been 25 by now <laughs> yeah <laughs> but you know we got it on the boga and it was about 13 and it was just the most amazing fish i've ever caught i bet it was and people you know you'll see on instagram or whatever here's my 20 pound peacock and some of those are a lot yeah. of them aren't but they're all amazing i mean you catch a 10-pound peacock or a 15-pound peacock, that's an amazing fish. And I think people have the impression that you go down to the Amazon, you're catching 20-pounders every day. Yeah, you get tired of, tired of catching them. That's not the case. All right. There's, there's one section of one river that you can go to that has a reputation for that, but you're going to pay $15,000 for that trip. Somebody out there right now is going, I'm going to do that. Yeah, somebody is. Yeah. And if you need to hire a photographer to go with you. <laughs> Yeah, we know one, don't we? <laughs> Brian Grossenbacher. No, I'm not kidding. You can hire me. No, but that's that place. That that's just an example of I, I can't I can't do both. Right. I can either fish or I can shoot photos. Right. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> at least you have that story. A lot of us don't have that story yet. Yeah, but I'm pretty thankful for that one. You should be. That one's worth uh, that one's worth being thankful for. Yeah. So, wow, you've been uh, you started a farm, farm pond. And we end up all the way in Brazil. Yeah. What part of Brazil? Where, what part of Brazil? Where'd you fly into? You fly into Manaus, which is northern Brazil, which is nice because Brazil is enormous. Yes. I've got a friend from Brazil, and he talks about where he lives. And I'm like, oh, how far is that from Rio? And he says, yeah, it's long. Forever, yeah. Yeah. Anywhere. Yeah. I mean, you can go, you can fly down to Rio, and that's a, from Miami, that's probably a 10-hour flight. Yeah. Manaus is about a five-hour flight. So it's not bad. Oh, that's not terrible. Yeah. So, I mean, you can leave Atlanta and, you know, eight hours later you can be in Manaus. And then from there you take about a, you stay in a hotel one night, nice uh -huh. hotel, take about a 45-minute flight, little jungle flight, land in a little airstrip. You get on a speedboat from there for about 45 minutes and jet upriver, which is really fun and you get to see, you know, you really get to see stuff on, yeah. the, on that travel. And then you arrive at the mothership and... Oddly enough, that's my favorite part of that trip. The arrival or the mothership? The arrival, getting to the mothership. Yeah, and it would be a lot of fun. And all my guys that went with me, I hosted a trip this past year, and the guys that went with me said, what's your favorite part? And I told them that, and they were all looking at me like, that's weird. Yeah. I would have thought the fishing or exploring through that. And for some reason, just when you get on that mothership, it's like, okay, I'm committed. And this isn't, uh, I'm not staying in a lodge, as cool as lodges are. Oh, yeah. I'm not staying in a hotel. This is where I'm sleeping here, I'm eating here, I'm taking showers on this thing, and every morning we're going to wake up somewhere different because the captain motors all night. Okay. So you just it's just an adventure. That sure is. And That's then Huck Finn stuff. It is. And yeah. then when when all my guys got on the boat this year, it was funny you're seeing these 50-year-old guys all of a sudden they're giddy. Oh yeah. And one of the guys came over to me and he was like, "I remember you said this was your favorite part. Like I totally get it now." <laughs> I was like, "Good. Yeah. It, it's it's crazy. It's a, you know, for if you're lucky, it's a once in a lifetime." experience to get to do something like that to travel to the amazon safely right uh is is awesome you don't have to sleep with the spiders or anything that way do you no and that's what a lot of people think like uh everything in the amazon if you want to read a really cool book um it's called river of doubt by candace uh, millard uh -huh. it's about uh president roosevelt theodore roosevelt after he lost his last election he to cope he went and was the first human being to run this river this uncharted river in the amazon and now it's called Rio Roosevelt, a oh. huge river. Uh -huh. And uh, in that book, the author really describes the wildlife and the goal of everything in the, in the jungle is to hide. So you don't see a lot. Like I've seen one anaconda, and it was from a long way away. That's and, good. And you, yes, that's where you <laughs> want to see them. But like the, the worst thing there is mosquitoes. Oh, but when yeah. you're on the water, I, I've, I haven't been bit by a mosquito yet. Now, if you go 10 feet into the jungle, you're going to get eaten alive by mosquitoes. But as long as you're on the mothership or in the bass boat fishing, you're not going to even get bit by one. No kidding. Not at all. So huh. uh, 
I, I mean, I haven't done any of the malaria stuff because you, you honestly, unless you're, unless you're running into the jungle for some reason, you don't need it. Yeah. You're not going to get bit by a mosquito. That's so, crazy. Yeah, it really is. You'd I think wonder. it'd just be constant. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But Spiders jumping out of trees at you. None yeah. of that. Yeah. No. All right. Maybe I'll think about going down there. You then. should go, Dan. I should. I'm telling you. I think, it, I think it'd be good for me. It would. I might want to write a book. New goals <laughs> set right here at, at the Unicoi for us. That's it. <laughs> so, David, that's been, that's a, that's quite a trip right there. And I've, yeah. I've, I've followed you. Uh, I don't know how we became friends on Facebook. I can't remember how, however we did it. It, yeah. was, it was, it was I'm a great you. thing <laughs> because what you're, in my mind, what you're most known for is your Walmart <laughs> lore. <laughs> and, and so I was thinking about it, of, of some of the things that you've written. Here's my take on Walmart. Oh, God. If, if you go into Walmart and you don't see somebody that's a little weird or a little crazy or a little something, uh, something's wrong because there's somebody yeah. like that in every one of them. Yeah, you're, you've entered a weird dimension. Right. And if, if you, you can't see normal people. Yeah, but if you can't find somebody that's a little weird, a little, little strange, it's probably you. It's you. Definitely. It's a scary, that's a scary scenario. So what's your, what's your, what's your, your favorite? I've got a couple of favorites, but what's your favorite? <laughs> <laughs> what's your favorite Walmart? Oh uh, man. Your favorite trip to Walmart. Let's say, let's just put it that way. There was one and it's been, it's been probably a couple of years ago now and I don't remember everything that happened, but my favorite part of it, it was just a big string of chaos, but in the middle of it, I heard this family arguing about what kind of grape juice they were going to buy. <laughs> And I was losing it. I mean, most of the time I just keep moving and I don't even laugh. I'm just, I'm processing it and trying to remember it so I can write it all down later. And uh, it's just a little stupid creative exercise for me. Oh, yeah. But this family, I I mean, I stopped. I was like bent over in the middle of the store just (laughs) chuckling. This family was just full on in a fight over what grape juice they were going to get. And and they were very, very country family. Right. And so the little, little girl was saying, no, daddy, I want the white grape juice. And then the dad, what the dad said really set me off. He said, uh, he said, no, I like the purple grape juice for its taste properties. Taste properties. I was like, what? (laughs) Taste properties? I was just losing it. I mean, I was crying. I was laughing so hard. And they were just going, I mean, they were going at it. Where would that even come from? I don't know. It's taste properties. Uh, But sometimes I still think, I wonder wonder which one they picked. They probably picked the purple one. I bet they did. Yeah. Yeah, That's, that's some... That's a strong argument. Yeah. Taste properties is a strong argument. Yeah. Concord won the day. Yeah. That's a, I'm glad fish don't sit and, and talk about that. You know, <laughs> I don't know the taste properties of that deceiver. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That'd make our jobs harder. It'd make it really hard. Yeah. I'm, I'm Again, I'm back to the big, dumb brown trout. That's what I think carp do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Absolutely. They do. Unless it's cicada season or something yeah. like that. And then they're, then they're, then they're big dumb. And dumb. Yep. Again. I like big dumb carp too. I think I just like big <laughs> dumb fish. Yep, big and dumb. Big and dumb. Yeah, it can't be both. one or the other. No. Yeah, yeah. So, all right, David. Well, gosh, that's, I don't know how long this has been, but it's been a little while. Uh, man, I appreciate you coming by and yeah. and, and and talking with us and, and meet, meeting us here. I know that you and Jimmy got to go fish today, and while I was traveling, and and I hope you had a good day. We didn't really talk about your day on the river, but I would say that fishing with Jimmy and being on the river here in in Helen, Georgia, is not a bad place to be. Always fun. But I appreciate the discussion with you. Uh, Thanks, everybody, for stopping by Southeastern Fly, and uh, we'll see you on the next episode of the Angler's Influence.